Well, out on the trawler, the most obvious waves we can see are the water waves, like these ripples out here on the lake. But as far as the trawlermen are concerned, perhaps more important, at least for their safety, are the invisible waves, the waves we can't see, like uh, the radio waves, which are used in their global positioning system, in their communications equipment, and in their radar. And then there's the sound waves used in their sonar for detecting fish, but once again, they're invisible, so it's rather difficult to really see what's going on. If we're going to get to the bottom of the invisible waves these guys used to communicate, let's get back to basics. Neil's going to turn all these gadgets off so that we're deaf and blind, alone. Now they're going to have to make do without the technology and do things the old-fashioned way. Ivan Chaston has spent a lifetime at sea. He's retired from fishing now, but keeps his hand in running the ferry between East and West Loo. Ivan and his friend Lewis Butters remember the way they used to share yeah, news of a good catch. You'd have a bit of rag if you, if you hold your trawl up. Oh, yeah. You had ten stones, say, of fish. When the other boat was coming close to you, you have a bit of rag and wave ten times. Or your old skin. Or whatever amount of fish you had, you know? And he'd wave back and say what he had. Well, sometimes in daylight, you'd rather wave your royal skins to attract our attention, or you'd have your sail, what we call a mizzen, and lower you up and down, things like that. In night time, you'd either blink your lights, or you'd put up an old flare. You'd have a, a, a like an old tin, then you'd have like a, how can I explain it? Like a mop bit, yeah. you know, and it'd be soaked in paraffin or stuff like that, and you'd load it up, and put it up. There were many ways of signalling to another boat, but in the days before radio, if you wanted a chat, the only way to do it was to shout. Right, well, if you're going to give up your radios, we'd better test out your lung power. Go on, then. Off you go. Can you still hear me? Plain this day. Are you getting me, Neil? Yeah, I'm getting you. Are you still getting me? I'm getting you fine. So they're not using radio waves to talk now, but they're still using waves, sound waves. Yes, I'm still getting you, Neil. The problem with sound waves is that they spread out in all directions, so the further away you are, the fainter the sound is. Also, sound gets absorbed in the air, and if you're outside, then the wind blows the air around and the sound's even harder to hear. Can you still hear me now? You're getting fainter. So are you. Start shouting. <laughs> While they get on with shouting at each other, let's talk sound. Sound waves are really hard to see, but the way they work is a lot like this slinky. Imagine for a moment that these slinky links are individual air molecules. If I put in a bit of oscillation at this end, you can see the energy travels down to the other end of the spring as a wave. And that's how your voice works. When you speak, on a tiny scale, the air molecules push into their neighbours and then bounce back. And so your voice travels through the air like a compression wave. As I'm talking now, I'm producing a sound wave. That's a compression wave in the air. But what is a wave? Well, a formal definition is that it's a periodic or regularly repeating disturbance that transports energy from one place to another. And a sound wave is a so-called longitudinal wave. That means that the variation is in the same direction that the wave travels. Now sound travels fine through air, but it travels even quicker through solids such as metal. That's why if you're in a tube station, you'll hear the sound of the train coming along the tracks before you hear the sound through the air. So perhaps one way our fishermen could do better is with the old tin can telephone. You speak into one end, the sound wave travels along the string and is heard at the other. But maybe that's not too practical out at sea, so our fishermen will have to think of something a bit better. The aids to uh speak at sea basically were only a tin trumpet. I mean, apart from the voice itself, the tin trumpet would focus the sound and help it carry over the water a bit better than just a straightforward shout. Is that any better? Yes, that's better. One way to make shouting work better is to use one of these. There you go, Neil. Thank you very much. A loud hailer stops the sound energy spreading out all over the place and pushes it all only in the direction that you point it. Can you still hear me now? Yes, I'm still getting you, Neil. Are you getting me now? Yeah, I'm getting you, Neil. We're going to drop it across, see how far apart we can get. The 
problem with shouting between boats is that you've got a lot of noise going on in the background. There's the, the wave noise, there's the wind noise, and there's just the question of whether you really understand what's being said and whether you hear it properly. We're just about on the limit now. This loud hailer technology does have its limits. I don't think it's quite up to the job, really. Neil, what do you reckon? No, it's hard on the voice, and it also <laughs> it's uh, we're, we're quite close together, so uh, we need to be a lot further apart to do the job that we're trying to do today. So this distance here, what are we, about 100 yards, 150 yards? No good for working? No, no, no. not at all. <laughs> Well, they can just about talk to each other, but there's no way they can talk to land. Now, you might think that that would have been scary, but it made the captains all powerful. The authority of a master mariner was always summed up as master under God, and that was a very real positive expression. Um, the only one person between you and your maker at sea was the captain, and whatever he did and decided affected you materially. If he made the wrong decision, and the ship may be wrecked, and you went to your maker. We never had a will, says, when we first started. No echo sounders, just a, as he said, just a compass. Follow the birds and look for the signs. Colour the water, date on, bubbles, fish coming up, things like that. When you're out at sea, you've got periods of time when you're not working. You've got moments of contemplation, and you tend to look out at the immensity of the sea and the huge sky and maybe the stars, and you just wonder how it happened, how it came to be, and how do you fit in in this little dot in eternity? On occasions he's been out on his own, which I really don't like, for, obviously for safety purposes, and I'm always saying to him that he must, just so he doesn't fall asleep or anything, that he must like keep in contact, if he isn't pairing, but always on the radio with other people. And I will phone him quite often if he's out on his own. Thank <laughs> you.